Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Twit Specials is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is a Twit Live special, episode 33 for August 27th, 2010. Government 2.0. Across America, cities are in crisis. Every year, city governments have to try to do more and more for their citizens with less and less money. What if we made it easier for everyone to lend a hand? What if we could help your city work better just by using your smartphone? What if everyone had the same access to information as City Hall? What if City Hall spoke with citizens the way citizens speak with each other? What if some of the most talented designers and technologists in the country apply those talents to building web apps that work for cities and citizens? Code for America is looking for people who are ready to find out. We want to see how the talent of the tech industry makes cities work better, and we need your help. As a Code for America fellow, you'll spend 11 months building technology that makes government more open, more efficient, and more responsive. And you'll do that by working with civic and industry leaders to build applications that can be spread to cities across the country. It's your chance to do good while doing what you're really good at. Every new movement needs heroes, and the first Code for America fellows are going to be in the spotlight. Code for America is looking for people with the talent to make technology work and the passion to make American cities work better. Code the next chapter of American history. Apply to be a Code for America fellow today. We want to welcome you. Good evening, everybody, to the Twit Cottage and a special. We don't usually do a lot of specials, but we thought this was a really great topic. A special on Government 2.0, what it means and what you can do、uh, to help it. And we've got some really great people in studio with us, starting with,、uh, to my left, Tim O'Reilly of、uh, O'Reilly Media, who actually,、yeah. you put on a Government 2.0. Uh, conference. How, right. how many years have you been doing that? Well, this is our second year for the event we call the Gov 2.0 Summit. We also have a, a, a related event called the Gov 2.0 Expo. And,、uh, and you've published books like this Open Government, Collaboration, Transparency, and Participation in the Practice? That's right.、Uh, in general, what we're trying to do across all of our business is to help make good futures happen.、Right. We see a lot, and we spend a lot of time watching、uh, technology. Uh, bubble up from hackers and people who are just doing things for the hell of it.、Mm -hmm. And if you look around for the last、uh, four or five years, there's been a lot of people hacking on government data, hacking on applications to make government work better,、uh, trying to get more transparency.、Uh, you know, the, actually, the second Google Maps mashup ever was chicagocrime.org, which was you know, crime data put on a map. And of course, it went from there. Uh, people like My Society in the UK,、um, you know, creating sites like fixmystreet.com,、right. which now, of course, has led to, site,、yeah. to、uh, things here in the US like C Click Fix and the Open 311 API and so on. But、uh, we just saw a lot of activity there, and we tend to uh, go uh, try to put fuel on the fire when we see something interesting happening. It is interesting. Jen Palka is also here. Jennifer is、uh, with the. Uh, the, the thing, the group, the organization you just, you just saw, Code for America. That's right.、Um, and you've been working on this for some time as well. This is not your first foray into the Government 2.0.、Uh, well, I got, came to it through working on Gov2 with, with Tim. I'd been working on the Web 2.0 events, and it was pretty inspiring、uh, to, to watch Tim sort of frame this movement when he was、um, originally putting the, the Gov2 stuff out there and trying to define it for people because I think there was a sense of opportunity, but there wasn't really clarity about what that was going to mean.、Uh, well, it's, a big, it's, a, of it's kind of a big omnibus concept. I mean, it's not, it's transparency, it's accountability, it's using、uh, Enterprise 2.0 and social media in government. I mean, it's a lot of things, isn't it? It's not just one. One thing, is it? I think people thought that it was going to be social media in government. And I think what Tim did was put a different frame around that, which made it a deeper concept. Yeah, the, the idea that I started focusing on was first of all, that it's about getting government up to speed with where technology is taking us.、Mm -hmm. 
And if you followed any of the work I've done around Web 2.0, you realize that I've been thinking how the Internet is becoming a platform, that that platform is driven uh, largely by data subsystems of various kinds, you know, uh, whether it's search or uh, social networks. And then you look at government. It's got huge contributions of data to many parts of that Internet economy. Uh, and so a lot of what I started talking about was how does government become a player in this uh, coming Internet platform? And well, that's that, interesting. So you're going the other direction. Yeah. And, and, and of course, instead of are, bringing the technology to government, it's how does government become a player? Yeah. And, and of course, some of it is the government is already a player. You know, right. We forget that uh, uh, systems like the GPS uh, were built by the government, are operated by the government. Right. You know, uh, and, and, and there was a policy decision. The Internet was started by the government. Yeah, although that, that's a bit of a special case in a way because it was this sort of research project right. that got out of hand. Whereas GPS <laughs> is something the government really invested in and built for its own purposes uh, and is still using for its own purposes. But they made a crucial policy decision to open up the GPS. Uh, for civilian use. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, it's kind of interesting because it goes back to Ronald Reagan. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. In 1983, the GPS system wasn't even finished. Um, but there was a, 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 an incident where a U.S. airliner strayed in a North Korean airspace and was shot down. And uh, Reagan said, well, when we finish this GPS thingy, whatever it is, we'll uh, never we, we, should, we, we, should, <laughs> we should open it up for civilian use. <laughs> yeah. So it was eventually Bill Clinton who, who did open it up. But, you know, you can look at it that way. I like to say uh, Ronald Reagan is the true father of Foursquare. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and that, that idea that there are certain kinds of government interventions that have profound market consequences and can lead to, to private sector activity is, is sort of a really interesting one mm. that I feel like I've been trying to evangelize as a way of thinking about how do we use IT and government more effectively. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of ways that the government uh, and the design of government programs is a lot like uh, a kind of vending machine. You know, we put in taxes, uh, we get out services. Right. And that clearly is unsustainable. And a lot of what I've been trying to get uh, people to think about is how do we do more of these GPS-like or Internet-like uh, interventions where government designs a program uh, that just catalyzes private sector activity. And, and of course, this is a very different way of thinking about participation. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting ahead of... of uh, this question you were starting to talk to Jen about Code for America, and well, Code uh, for America is almost the diff opposite direction where it's well, it's working from from uh, at, at the local level. Right. Uh, I think partly because that's it's easier to make change happen there. <laughs> well, let me ask you about that, Jen, because one of the things that came up when we started to talk about doing a special on government is uh, all the people in our chat room who are watching live right now start saying we hate government. We're not government. Government sucks. Government doesn't work. And I think there is a sense, especially among technology folks, geeks, if you will. Uh, less government's better government. It's not of the people. It's not our government. It's somebody doing it to us. Right. How do you get people to code for America? So, yeah, that's a really good question, and I think there's a couple different layers where you want to answer it. Um, one is there's a huge demographic shift going on, and we are, our program, we have a fellowship where we recruit people who come in and work with city governments for a year, to upgrade their technology. Um, they need it bad, I bet. They do. They yeah. do. I can tell you some some very, uh, some very sort of horror stories about yeah. just, just the way stuff gets done with all the best of intentions. But um, we're looking, you know, we're open to anybody. We're getting a lot of professionals applying who have years of experience. But we're also really trying to target the millennials and, say, and get them invested in government in a way that, that certain other communities aren't, right? But... The Center for American Progress came out with a study recently that said that the millennials are actually the most pro-government generation in Interesting. decades. And if you think about it, it makes sense because these are the, this is the first generation that's growing up taking social networking, uh, the cloud, things like this for granted. And so what they've grown up seeing is that systems are better the more people are part of them. Yeah. They always have a voice in whatever it is they do. Just think about the world they've grown up in. So they're not, they're coming in and saying, sure, government's broken, but we obviously know how to fix it. <laughs> we just have to recraft it they're in our They're powerful in a way, yeah. And they have yeah. this, they don't believe in government as it exists now. They're not, it's not that they believe government works, it's that they believe very firmly that government can be fixed. And we want to tap that 
uh, energy and give them a way that they can actually help fix government because that's one of the problems right now. Government is sort of this walled institution. And as Tim talks about recrafting it as a platform, we also just have to recraft it as an institution with many more connections to the to the private sector. Jen, uh, can you maybe talk a little bit about how the program works, what Code for America actually does? Sure. So we um, work with uh, we work with a set of cities that are trying to identify themselves as leaders. We put out an open call for participation to cities. We just saw that video too. Right. Yeah. Um, well, first we selected our cities. We we're working with Boston, Seattle, Philadelphia. Uh, Washington, D.C., and Boulder, Colorado this year. Not small towns. Philadelphia. Cities, big hmm? cities. And Philadelphia. Too. Did I say Philadelphia? Okay, and Philadelphia, if I didn't say that. Um, so these are cities that have said that they understand our mission, that mm -hmm. they want to create technology that will make their city more open, um, more transparent to citizens, more efficient. They, we, we know we can save these cities money, that there's waste in the systems mm -hmm. that they're using currently um, that can help them let their citizens participate in government. So it's not just that they can see it, but they can really do something. Um, and they want to create applications that can be reused by other cities. So we identify these, we go out and recruit. We had an open call for fellows and you saw that video. And we were hoping for maybe 100, maybe 200 applications. We got 362 applications for fellows. So right now we're selecting them and they'll start working on the projects with cities uh, in January. Well, that proves your point. There is yeah. interest. They want to do it. They want to help. One of the things you, you did at Government 2.0 is you asked participants uh, to give their thoughts about Government 2.0 and what it means. We have a, a clip of um, Kevin Curry. He's the chief scientist at Bridgeborne, which is a company that uh, works with government defense agencies. These were uh, his thoughts on Government 2.0. Gov 2.0 to me is about reminding everyone that there is no abstract, faceless thing called the government. It's we the people. Whether you're talking about federal, state, local, tribal, in your communities, in your neighborhoods, we all play a role in how government functions and whether or not it adds value to our lives or takes away. And I think Gov 2.0 is an opportunity to add value. We hear that a lot in this. In fact, in your book, it comes up a lot. Abraham Lincoln's uh, government of the people, by the people, for the people. That's kind of what it's about for some of these people. We're going to get Carolyn Lawson uh, on the line uh, right now. She's Deputy Director, uh, Technology Services Governance Division, Director of E-Services at the State of California. She's joining us uh, via Skype. Carolyn, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see me? I can't see you. Start your camera. Oh, I thought I did. It's that little blue button. There it is. Oh, okay. Tim O'Reilly's with us, uh, Jen Palka, and there's Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Carolyn. The technology Hi. works. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you like this idea, uh, government, uh, of and by the people, for the people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've said for a long time that uh, my favorite quote is Abraham Lincoln. It, we're a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And as a public servant, I do the for the people part every day of my life, but the of the people and by the people, that's really up to the constituents themselves. Um, that's one of the reasons why I think that the thought of government as a platform, the thought of engagement, particularly engagement of the younger folks, the thought of the things that Code for America is doing, really grabbing on to those issues that we can't solve as a government for whatever reason, whether it's because we um, can't see it, don't have time to get to it, our systems are so old, we just don't have the same nimble environment, whatever it is. I think that this is really a, a step in the right direction in terms of public service and in terms of public engagement, in terms of being a democracy. So are you seeing... Uh as Jen has seen, have seen uh, people stepping forward to help, are they? Is there interest among the constitu your constituency? Yeah, absolutely, and I find it in some pretty interesting ways. Um, we have got a Twitter feed for our employment development department, and th we now have ten thousand followers in this Twitter feed. But not only our our employment development employees answering and tweeting but people who follow are tweeting and retweeting so what we have is a community that's grown around this horrendous um, unemployment that we have here in california that's trying to take care of one another and we found some pretty interesting tweet trails that are showing people where to go on the edd website or other california websites that might have benefits that are available if they're in the same situation so because we've reached out in that way we're finding that the community is continuing to reach out beyond our borders but out beyond what we had even anticipated what's the reaction 
of uh, other people in the in the state government to this. Do they? I mean, when you say we're going to do a Twitter feed, what, what do they say? Uh, well, we didn't exactly tell them. <laughs> Good thinking. <laughs> so Better to we, ask forgiveness than permission, as they say. Yeah. Um, what we did is we had this idea that this might work. We put it out there and said, oh, look, it's working. Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> and you have 10,000 followers here. It's CA underscore EDD on Twitter. Yeah, I think this it, idea of, of actually just doing it and then sharing the successes is, I think, something that cuts across all of the areas that we're talking it's about. Skunk Works. There are a lot of innovators in government and you know we just have to find them just like you do in the private sector you know somebody does something mm -hmm. really cool and then everybody else goes oh yeah let's do something like that mm -hmm. and uh, the same thing is happening in government you know one agency uh, says wow we're gonna you know play around with Twitter and they have some success and then everybody does it uh, somebody does something with YouTube they go oh yeah we can do that too uh, the, somebody else makes the move to cloud computing and that kind of coming back around to uh, code for America uh, What's really great is when you get down to the city and state level, uh, you have a lot more experiments and you have a much bigger marketplace. Uh, you don't have big centralized uh, uh, decision making. And there's this great quote from Justice Lewis Brandeis where he said that the states are the laboratories of democracy. Mm. It's even more true at the city level. Mm -hmm. And so you can have a city that says, hmm, I'm going to do something innovative. And then it can be spread to other cities. Uh, you know, a really great example of this is one I, I learned recently. Uh, you know, when you look at the Google and you can get uh, transit directions, say if you're in New York City, that was initiated by the city of Portland. The city of Portland basically uh, went to Google and said, we're trying to come up with an API for how we can format our data in such a way that you can use it. And, you know, that came from one city, spread to other cities. And I think that's a, a big part of the mission of Code for America. Uh, the idea is that we will get these young technologists who will go into uh, these leading cities, they'll do something really cool, and then we'll take that and we'll, we'll give it to other cities. And we'll maybe work with uh, you know, private sector companies to have that technology spread. And in future, I think the mission of Code for America will shift from um, building technology for cities to actually just disseminating it. So you might imagine, for example, right now, uh, a city like Boston or Washington, D.C. Is, is putting up funding to, to host these fellows to build this cool software. But you can imagine in five years we'll be sending out a uh, Code for America fellow for a month to some little, set, uh, some little city in Oklahoma to set up a bunch of free software for them uh, so that they can have uh, the latest stuff too uh, without having to pay for it. Carolyn, do you see a lot of uh, resistance to this kind of thing? Uh, do people come at you and say, no, that's not how we do it here? You know, I used to, but I don't anymore. I think the people who were the most resistant are the ones who are also the most afraid of the economic situation that we're in. Mm. The budget crisis has, um, well, if I can say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, caused them to hide under their desks. So those <laughs> of us who really want to march out and get stuff done, we're able to do that. There's a, a lot less resistance when we come up and say, I've got this idea and it's free or we bring free things to our webmaster user group and they bring it back to their departments and say, right. hey, you know, the e-services office just taught us how to do this. We don't have to get into the labels of Gov 2.0 or Web 2.0 or even saying that it's edgy or innovative. We just, this is going to fix whatever it is. It's going to accomplish whatever we need to accomplish. It's going to do this thing for us we couldn't do otherwise. Sometimes crisis is a good thing. It forces people that's to right. think new, in new ways. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And we have this wonderful opportunity uh, to do more with less. Yeah. Uh, we had this really interesting conversation uh, a couple of weeks ago with Anish Chopra, the federal CTO, uh, and they're trying to think through uh, how could you make a, a federal agency act more like a startup. And they're looking particularly at this uh, new consumer federal uh, consumer um, uh, 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 financial protection agency. And it was just a brainstorm. Who knows if any of this would actually be implemented. But one of the key things we, we came up with is, well, if you're a startup, you try to figure out what's already out there that's free that you can use, right. that you can leverage. You know, so there's cloud computing stuff. There's right. uh, all kinds of great, uh, you know, low, low cost services. There's free software. And that way you focus down on what are the things that you really have to build. And then, of course, you build you know, rapid feedback loops. Now, all this is not really how government procurement works today. Uh, because somebody is incented to uh, make this thing uh, as fat a contract as possible. And so we're actually trying to figure out, is there a way to 
to write the uh, RFPs for this uh, agency that, that, such as that. Skinny uh, as possible. So, well, so that you kind of say, oh, you don't get to charge it for this, this, and this, because we've already identified these as things that, that can be done easily or cheaply. Carolyn, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We really uh, appreciate getting some insight into uh, what you're doing at the uh, e-services in the state of California. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Carolyn Lawson, who is... Uh, Director of e-services for the state of California. And actually, as, as long as we're uh, uh, talking along the lines of um, data sets, because it seems it could be coming up a lot, um, we have an interesting clip uh, also from your Government 2.0 uh, Summit of uh, a company that's using um, data sets from, uh, well, Weather and the uh, SEC. That's already available. And this is uh, what uh, happened when the MTA got into the act. This is uh, actually, there's no sound on this. So maybe, Tim, you know... You know about this. This is Ushida. Ushahidi. Ushahidi. Uh, it's, a, it's a web platform to map violence erupting in Kenya after that country's elections in uh, 2007. So when Ushahidi means testimony, I guess, in Swahili. So the idea is that they're creating crisis maps, integrating reports from people on the ground. Um, yeah, Ushahidi is this really fascinating uh, platform uh, for, for decentralized reporting. As you, as you mentioned, it was uh, originally designed for reports of election violence, uh, but it really came into prominence, I think, after the earthquake in Haiti. Uh, and what, what it was really forged into a real crisis response platform. And, and if you imagine, you know, what happens in an earthquake, you, a massive earthquake like, like happened in Haiti, you have people trapped under buildings, right. uh, and you have people saying, help, help. Uh, how do we, you know, get help? And so uh, one of the, the uh, ways that people were calling out for help was via uh, text messaging. So Ushahidi uh, basically takes text messages, tweets, other uh, forms of, of outreach, and basically locates them on a map and also locates them on a timeline. They also have some technology for figuring out sort of concentrations, i.e. Um, uh, where there are the most reports, uh, most urgency, uh, you know, even maybe figuring out which ones are, are, are fake because uh, they've, they've looked for patterns in the data. But here you are in Haiti, and in a lot of these poor locations, there wasn't anybody, uh, there were no maps. Right. So you couldn't say, oh, it's on the corner of 4th and Vine. You had to right. say, oh, my God, you know, where is it? And, and so there's, a, there's an open source project called OpenStreetMap that went in there. fantastic project. It was amazing what they did. And they went in and they mapped all these, uh, the, in these, weeks. these slums, right. And so the... the, the, the uh, uh, crisis response could be uh, located. Oh, but then wait, it's still more complicated than that because these various um, text messages are, are, aren't in English. They're in Haitian Creole, and a lot of the rescuers speak English. Well, they used uh, Mechanical Turk uh, and uh, a product called, uh, a company called Crowdflower to actually reach out to the Haitian diaspora community, which turns out is a lot in Boston, uh, to do, to translate these things on the fly into English, and then they were using Skype to uh, sort of get this stuff out to all the the rescue agencies. Patrick Meyer, the founder of Ushahidi, or one of the, the co-founders, uh, uh, said uh, it was kind of amazing. You know, uh, the U.S. Marine Corps was taking orders for me, yeah, <laughs> you know, on the Red Cross. You <laughs> know, but it was it was they they were the ones who were able to pull all the pieces together, and that's this great example of this technology that's been built that's cutting edge. And that, uh, you know, would not be built by a government procurement. But in this particular case, the State Department really got behind this and gave them air cover. And that's why the Red Cross and the U.S. Marines were saying, wow, yeah, we can use this platform. We can listen to these guys. And so that's a really interesting, uh, you know, Gov2 story because it's about uh, volunteers uh, doing the work uh, and the government really just giving permission and blessing. Right. Government also has a lot of data. I want to bring in uh, Andrew Hoppin right now. He is he's somebody who's used to working with uh, with data sets as a planetary geologist, but and a technologist. But he's also the CIO for the uh, New York State Senate. Andrew, thank you for uh, joining us uh, this evening on Twit. We appreciate it. Glad to be here, Leo. We wanted to talk a little bit about the idea of uh, transparency. We haven't really addressed that, but one of the purposes, one of the real advantages of Government 2.0 is making all those data sets that the government has available so people can manipulate it those things like the uh, the databases uh, for the MTA or the weather or the SEC what what are you doing in the state of New York around that 
So uh, in our particular legislative body, uh, to put it mildly, we uh, didn't have the best reputation. <laughs> and so our motivation for publishing data initially when a new political party that hadn't been in power in this legislative body for 43 years was elected in uh, November of 2008 was uh, purely transparency initially. The mandate was clean the place up, let the sunlight shine in. Uh, open up our data, our legislative and administrative data, so that people on the outside know what's going on here in Albany. Um, so initially, the motivation was purely transparency. It's root out the corruption. Uh, literally, the majority leader of the state Senate for 14 years before this uh, handover of political power was indicted on federal corruption charges uh, this mm -hmm. past summer. Mm -hmm. and, and so what have you done so in, we, in we that found direction? Course, now, so it, it, we, we uh, began by uh, overhauling a very web 1.0 website and turning it into a, a true Gov 2.0 website. Um, and primarily, first and foremost, trying to get all of our legislative data out. Uh, you previously had to pay thousands of dollars literally to get access to information about bills, about laws that were being made. Um, we opened all that data up, uh, put a nice GUI in front of it uh, with uh, a nice sort of Lucene search auto suggest, you know, sort of Google easy to find, uh, look up a keyword that you're interested in and find what laws are being debated about it. Uh, and we put an API in front of it so that uh, third parties could then make use of that data. We also opened up all of our administrative data. So literally how much money I get paid, uh, where every penny that the Senate spends as an institution is spent, is now available in a near real time, searchable, sortable, mashable form. Lucene's open source. Do you have difficulty uh, uh, explaining open source versus proprietary databases and solutions uh, to government? Is that part of the problem? Well, as Carolyn uh, alluded to, not when we have a $9 billion budget <laughs> deficit in our state. Um, you know, we, we were asked to do a lot of new things and told to spend a lot less money doing it than the Senate has historically spent. So, um, you know, I, I certainly came in with a bias towards open source anyway, having been involved in the Drupal projects since 2005. But um, that really was our only way to accomplish what we were being asked to do. So we relaunched our website, nysenate.gov, using Drupal, as That's the great. White House uh, somewhat so awesome. later did. Yeah. Um, we've, we're in the process of deploying an open source CRM system, so we really do have a bias towards open source, uh, both because we think it works, um, but also because it can save money. And as Jen alluded to, we think the potential for reuse of open source code developed by and used by government is tremendous. And that's when you get the real exciting cost savings this is when we innovate something, we can then share that with our peers and they are that much further ahead to solving their own problem without having to spend any money to do it. Senate's on, New York City State Senate's on Twitter. You've got an Android, iPhone, and iPad app. I mean, you really are uh, making this stuff available. So, Andrew, when uh, you're making your code available to uh, uh, to other people, how are how are you supporting it? You know, typically when somebody uh, runs an open source project, uh, they're continuing to maintain it. They're engaging with the community. What are your plans in that regard? Uh, so. Uh, Twofold, really. One, uh, we solve our own needs first and foremost. We don't have the mandate nor the budget or the staff really to explicitly support the needs of peers. But we want to be good community players because we know that long term we're best served by contributing what we create. So we do make an effort to uh, write good code. We post it all on GitHub. Um, we uh, encourage people both, though, to take it off in their own direction, fork it if they need to in order to uh, be able to meet their own needs because the needs of a different type of government in a different place may be nuanced enough to warrant that, um, as well as continuing to put up new code drops of our code as we as we iterate it uh, so that people will always have the latest uh, that we've produced. Um, we are also trying to actively network with our peers. We just held uh, the second annual uh, unconference uh, called Capital Camp in the Capitol in Albany. Uh, where we brought together developers, uh, c citizens, and civil servants and elected officials to talk about what we've done, to give us input, and actually to do code sprints with us, in some cases, on our code. Uh, so we're trying to build an active community practice around building the software tools that legislatures need. I think this is just great. Is this, you're actually probably, Andrew's a good example, Jennifer, of what you were talking about, of somebody coming from a technology community and coming in uh, helping government. Is this a new career for you, Andrew, or is this just a, 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 a passing through? <laughs> well, are you going back to planetary uh, we'll geology? 
we'll see what happens in the election in November. Uh, we I may get summarily uh, made, made to be passing through. But uh, that that notwithstanding, I mean, I th I came from uh, I've come in and out of government my whole life. I worked at NASA actually, but prior to this, uh, as a, and uh, not even as a scientist, but helping them to bring in uh, social media tools and and sort of open themselves up culturally. But I've also been an, a technology entrepreneur, and I think that's really important to have that. Uh, that people coming in from the outside, bringing fresh ideas and fresh blood, both both directions, bi-directionally. Um, I think that keeps both our private sector, uh, uh, who may learn from government people going out and starting Gov2.0 companies, that the, the civil servants are actually pretty smart and innovative themselves, and vice versa, bringing in people from the private sector into government, so that we do really have contemporary uh, ideas and fresh blood in there all the time. I don't think uh, that I'll be a career civil servant, um, but I certainly hope uh, to be able to contribute uh, to the life of the communities that I'm part of, uh, directly hands-on, whether inside or out of, outside of government for my whole life. Yeah, but go ahead, Jen. Yeah, you talked earlier about sort of the, um, some of the, the really negative perceptions in the, in the tech community about government. And I just, I do wish that people who have that attitude could meet people like Andrew and mm -hmm. some of the other leaders that have inspired Code for America and, in fact, are advisors to Code for America because... I think it would change their perceptions, not only of what government is and what it can be, but also um, it, that would inspire that, you know, we're trying to inspire millennials to take jobs in government. We want talent to flow into government. Right. And I think if they can see that someone like Andrews had that kind of impact, you know, people, sure, they want to go to startups and make money. But what they really want to do is they want to have an impact. And Andrews had a huge impact. Someone like Brian Sivak in Washington, D.C. is having a huge impact. Um, these are the leaders, and if we can make the millennials aspire to that kind of change, I think we have a really good hope of saving government. You know, it's uh, worth talking a little bit about the not just the uh, budget crisis in uh, city government, but also the demographic crisis. You've talked a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, in the 70s, 13% of uh, municipal managers were uh, over 40. Now it's 80%. So there's this real graying of the hall, uh, city halls, essentially. And so in the next five years, it's expected that about 60% of municipal workers will retire. So we have this opportunity to really get a lot of fresh blood into, into city hall, into the IT department, and every department that affects you as a citizen in your city. If we replace those people with nine to fivers, uh, we're missing a huge opportunity. And in fact, it's not just missing a huge opportunity. Cities are going to cities are in a much bigger crisis than people realize, and they're going to start to fail as cities. If we replace them with people like Andrew, we are going to have a reinvention that we haven't seen in years. Andrew, thank you for joining us. We're very fortunate, and the New York State Senate is very fortunate to have you uh, there. And I'm glad we could uh, talk to you this evening. My pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. You know, uh, going Thanks back to much. this Take combined, um, you know, cost and demographic crisis, uh, there's a really important idea, uh, you know, hidden inside this gov 2 discussion. Uh, when we start talking about participation and back to our uh, uh, government of, by, and for the people, there are mechanisms today for participation, for collaboration. You know, we hear terms like crowdsourcing. Mm -hmm. We see tools like Meetup. Uh, we see, uh, you know, uh, these applied in consumer areas like Groupon. Uh, you know, how do we actually rediscover the idea that government also is a vehicle for collective action? You know, because you have to realize that in the beginning, uh, you know, we didn't have this huge government. We had a pretty small government. And bit by bit, it grew, and, and we became more dependent on it, and we uh, did less and less for ourselves. And, you know, it goes back to this vending machine model. You know, we think participation means shaking the vending machine, uh, when in fact, you know, what participation ought to mean is actually focusing on the problems that we originally, you know, created government perhaps to solve. But if government isn't solving them, that doesn't mean that we can't... Uh, do something about it ourselves. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, Clay Johnson wrote a blog post about this where he, uh, he, he was at the Sunlight Foundation, uh, uh, where he was complaining about the fact that, uh, you know, when Washington, D.C. had a snowstorm last year, everybody was complaining because the, 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 the city wasn't getting around to plowing the streets. And it's like, okay, at what point, you know, the citizens get out there and, you know, with a snow shovel and dig themselves out? Yeah. Uh, you know, why is it that, that somehow uh, somebody else is supposed to do it? Uh, and you see a lot of these... 
uh, you know, 311 type calls. Uh, you know, uh, we were up in the uh, uh, city of Seattle and they said, oh, people are complaining about what they call up their sticker bushes which are basically, you know, brambles and blackberries. You go, well, come on, you know, you can pull out. You can, if there's one on your, you know, on on, on your uh, sidewalk, you could pull it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what a thought. <laughs> what a thought. You, uh, in the in this book, uh, Open Government, which is really a great read, Collaboration, Transparency, and Participation in Practice, you uh, have Carl Malamud's um, keynote from the Government 2.0 yeah. summit last year, yeah. which is, by the people, quite inspiring. People yeah. get okay. a chance to read that. The video of it is really quite inspiring. Is that online? Too. Yeah, it is online. Uh, Carl uh, really gives a stem winder of a speech, and he's got a, a he's got another really great one this year. It's it's actually a, a he was a little worried it might be a little inflammatory. We'll see. Let's go. It's received. Let's go. Let's yeah. light a fire. September seventh yeah. yeah. and eighth at the Grand Hyatt in Washington. That's the yeah. Government two point summit. When Carl gave that speech, there was standing ovation for something like ten minutes afterwards. Uh, it's funny because I just read it and I got chills, and it's I would great. love to see the video. Yeah. Yeah, you should look for it. Let me uh, play another clip. This is. Um, also from uh, uh, some people that you talked to at Government 2.0, this is um, uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, social media leave, Steve uh, Raddick. He's talking about uh, intelligence and wikis. People talk about transparency, I cringe. I spent a lot of time thinking about transparency in my PhD thesis. I to me, transparency is... is about access, but it's also about harder concepts such as uh, oversight or meaningful access. Do people have things they need in the form they need them? Um, accountability, can we reward and punish people, processes, and things? And the real elephant in the room, comprehensibility. Um, can the citizen incorporate government into their social being and sort of see it on the same level? So if you really mean one of those things when you say transparency, please say something a, a bit more precise. Actually, that's Joe Bion. And another good clip. Let me get, uh, let me get the um, Steve, Raddick. <laughs> Steve Raddick clip. Yeah. Here we go. I think this is Steve. What does Government 2.0 mean to me? I think it's about more than just the technology. It's what that technology enables us to do. Whether that's creating a blog to solicit public feedback, uh, or using a wiki to upload documents and, and collaborate more on intelligence. Uh, those are first steps, uh, but that's not Government 2.0. It's what you then do with that public comment and what you do with that wiki. Are you changing policies? Are you making policies better? Are you transforming processes to make them more useful? Are you able to uh, deliver better intelligence because you of that collaboration? I uh, want to bring in John Wunderlich right now. He's uh, the uh, policy director for the Sunlight Foundation. Couldn't be a better time to bring in somebody talking about uh, transparency right now. In fact, uh, with with all the attention being paid to WikiLeaks, uh, this is something you were... Hello, John. Welcome. Good evening. Hi. This is something you work with uh, uh, all the time with journalists to uh, help create transparent government. That's right. We do work often with journalists. That's, that's correct. What do you think of this whole WikiLeaks thing? Um, so I, this is, that, is, is that Gov 2.0? Uh, in a sense, it is. And I think that this is a great point in the conversation to talk about WikiLeaks um, because it's an example of both a step forward and sort of a complicated step. Um, and I think when we look at what's been happening recently with WikiLeaks, it's a reminder to me that we've got a lot of work to do to figure out where the, the web is leading us and where this new technology is taking us. So the Internet there's the, the old saying that the Internet uh, views whatever it is as a failure and then routes around it. <laughs> and in, the, in this case, we have the full force of the Internet and the public versus the, the United States military. And those are two very enormous forces. And when they come in contact with each other, um, it only takes a few people that want to leak documents and someone with the know-how and the reputation for being able to anonymize documents to have suddenly an explosive and potentially a very transformative situation. And I don't think that there are any simple opinions about WikiLeaks, but that's, I think that in a sense, that's characteristic of a lot of kinds of Web 2.0 or Gov 2.0 things that are happening now. The way technology is transforming government is not going to be simple. And so there's a lot of work to do to sort out what, what policies need to change and what the future is that we're going to find ourselves in soon Can or are already. Can you give me an idea of some of the projects uh, you're working on along these lines? 
Sure. So the, the Sunlight Foundation is uh, focused on getting government to release more information and build the tools and databases and policies that lead to a more open and transparent and accountable government. So a great example of that is the site that we recently recently released called transparencydata.com, which is the first site where you can search um, for campaign contributions and lobbying records from the federal and the state level. So that's one website that we put together using information from uh, from the government, uh, uh, distantly from the government, and then from the National Institute for Money and State Politics, a state level organization, and the Center for Responsive Politics, a federal level organization. And then we took that data, put it into a single database, and made a web page where, where you can search for this information. So all the government agencies that are responsible for releasing this information um, don't do a good enough job. And so third parties like the Sunlight Foundation are necessary to try to get them to do a better job and also to fill in the gaps until we can get them to fulfill their role. What else are you are you uh, working on? And this is this is actually amazing. I'm I'm sorry, I was trying to play with the database. <laughs> so my, my my favorite project. I loved it when you guys were taking the C-SPAN feed uh, during the uh, healthcare debates. I think it was and and showing the campaign contributions to each speaker. Isn't that a great mm -hmm. boy? Yeah, talk about uh, transparency uh, yeah, there. Exactly. Who's paying yeah, for I, that? I, I wish I, we'd see that on uh, CNN and yeah. Our, it's it, uh, you know, why don't uh, mainstream media yeah. uh, organizations do that? Are they afraid of uh, biting the hand that feeds them? What it. This is this data is so important, so valuable. Well, there's certainly an aspect of corporate media being corporate media, but I think separate from that, um, I love our Sunlight Live project too. And part of that is that my personal love for the internet. I, I think personally, there's a history with myself of resenting television and the right. way that it turns you into a passive viewer. And when you look at television, that the sort of bandwidth that you get when they show Speaker Pelosi, they'll have the the, the little blurb next to it says Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Speaker since X year or from California. And that's the context that they're able to provide. Um, but in order to really evaluate what's happening in often a very complex discussion, uh, which is happening in Congress or, or across government, the sort of context that you need is far deeper than that. So what we started playing with with our Sunlight Live tool um, was displaying, we were calling it data jamming. Somebody at Sunlight came up with that. And the idea of data jamming is sort of like culture jamming, is that when politicians are, are giving you a message, at the same time, we're displaying who's giving them money mm. or what the text is of the report that mm -hmm. they're citing and, and experimenting with the idea of real-time context for data. Because we think uh, a big part of the future of the internet is real-time online disclosure of information about what the government's doing. And all of our, our regulatory systems, all the important essential things that the federal government does, many of them are built on disclosure, but the way that that disclosure has worked historically has been ineffective. It's this, the kind of disclosure where in order to see the filings, you have to go to an office in, in, uh, in uh, some regional office in the Gulf of Mexico. So when the oil spill happened, we discovered all these filings that happened for, uh, for the all these public reports that had to be filled out before any oil drilling could happen. Um, and if you look a year ago, the, the public last summer, the public was completely absorbed with the idea of whether or not or offshore drilling should happen. Um, and if you look at that whole intense public debate that happened, at the same time, there were fraudulent reports being filled out that said, uh, where BP was saying that they were um, they were taking into account whether or not walruses would die in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and obviously, there are no walruses in the Gulf of Mexico. But those reports turned out to be completely fraudulent and false. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just that bought it. I just clip. went right with it. You know, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Walruses. Yeah. It must be so, a big problem. So the shame to me here is that our national conversation couldn't have been more focused on oil. And at the same time, our public disclosure right. system that was supposed to create accountable drilling was completely disconnected from it. And it took the, the nation's biggest environmental disaster and investigative journalists to find that. So if disclosure was working, that would have been discovered before there was ever an oil spill. Do you see yourself as journalists, as a tool for journalists? Uh, what do you see, uh, Sunlight Foundation? Or uh, so are you some hybrid thing? We, we are a crazy hybrid. We're yeah. an organization with investigative journalists. We have a, a big team of technologists, especially for a nonprofit. We have 15 or 18 uh, technologists in Sunlight Labs. Um, we're also, I'm, I'm technically a federally registered lobbyist, so I also lobby and meet with policymakers in Congress and in the executive branch. And we also do public organizing, too. So a lot of different things going on. So a really time. good point here when you say you're a registered lobbyist. It really brings home the fact that 
uh, in a democracy, there are a lot of different voices uh, who could be considered lobbyists, and some of them are uh, working for uh, what we might consider big bad corporations, and some of them are working in the public interest, like you are. Yeah, the big transparency, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, Sunlight Foundation, Sunlight Labs in particular, is, is known, um, you know, in, our, in sort of the, the community that uh, coalesces around Code for America, really, as the center for for hackers who want to do stuff with that data. So, um, in fact, we're often confused with Apps for America and Design for America, which mm -hmm. are the two apps, con uh, two apps contests and, and a design contest that that Sunlight uh, Foundation ran that have just had a huge impact and, and really been able to show to the world what people can do with this data that's beautiful and interesting and useful and, and really spawn this whole movement. John, who funds uh, Sunlight? So, uh, since we're called the <laughs> <laughs> I thought so, but I was just checking. That's Walruses. Okay. Uh, so since we're called the Sunlight Foundation, you can read about all of our funding on the on the website. But the, our biggest funder is the Omidyar Network, which is uh, Pierre. The, Pierre, the, the one of the real good guys. Yeah. Yes, you guys know. Um, so Pierre Omidyar, who's uh, famous for eBay. Yeah. So that's where most of our money has come from. And, but it's all on our website. We just borrowed your about page and did our exact same contributions, by the way. So we're following your idea. model and our funding also yeah. comes Transparency. from Transparency. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> from a meteor at night. Yeah. Great. So you don't have an agenda then, John. There's no there's no agenda except transparency. Well, we so I'm responsible for writing an agenda about what the government should be doing differently, but no, it's it's specifically about openness and accountability it's in not, government. It's not particularly partisan. No, we we are nonpartisan. We have a lot of allies on the right and on the left, and sometimes this is this is the one issue that they agree with. Um, if you look at, for example, the Coburn Obama bill. Uh, so now President Obama and the notoriously conservative, sometimes called Dr. No, Senator Coburn, uh, joined together to pass a bill that we cared about very much that created the first database of federal grants and contracts. So we, we often see uh, both sides of the ideological spectrum coming together around transparency. You have an agenda. It's to make government transparent and accountable. Exactly. That seems a fair agenda. John, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. It. It's great to talk thank to you. you. I had the wrong uh, URL at the beginning. It's sunlightfoundation.com. .org is uh, something else. Thank you, John Wonderlich. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, John. So uh, let's wrap up. I think what's been great is we've seen a lot of different examples of what Government 2.0 means, Tim. It, it, it isn't any one thing. Yeah, I think that's true of any uh, movement. When you... You don't. You only know in retrospect uh, what everything adds up to. Right. Uh, you know, we didn't know, for example, that uh, uh, you know the web was going to turn into uh, you know Google and not just AOL. Uh, we didn't know that uh, it would continue to morph and we'd see Facebook and Twitter and Foursquare and get satisfaction and uh, all these things coming out of this seed that was planted now getting on to be 20 years ago yeah. uh, when the PC revolution started we didn't know what it would lead to either and I think uh, a lot of what we need to get back to uh, as a country is uh, allowing more innovation to happen encouraging more innovation to happen and designing systems that are more innovative and, and that's again why I came back to a government as a platform as the central narrative of what should be different about Gov2.0. Because when you have a platform, uh, you're not actually doing all the work yourself. Uh, you're creating the conditions for other people uh, to do uh, whatever they can imagine. And, and that's why, for example, Apple was able to revolutionize the, the cell phone market. It wasn't just they built a super cool phone. They did that, but then they opened it up to developers. And there were literally hundreds of thousands of apps that not only did Apple not have to write, but they would never have bothered to write. And a lot of those are creating enormous value, not just for uh, the, the consumer, but also for the developers. You know, I think Steve Jobs got up there with a slide at WWDC and said, we paid out a billion dollars to app developers. And in a similar way, we're hoping that, you know, this, this gov 2 movement isn't just about transparency. It isn't just about citizen participation, although it is those things too. But it's also about reinvigorating the infrastructure of our country so that we can take advantage of this new technology for public purposes so that we, the people, can actually start to harness the power of the Internet to do more for ourselves, uh, to, to, to create 
value for each other uh, in, in a kind of expanded uh, marketplace of ideas. It's very exciting. Government 2.0 Summit is coming September 7th and 8th at the Grand Hyatt in Washington. I want to thank you, Tim O'Reilly, for joining us. Jen Palka, uh, Jen's site, codeforamerica.org. i got to get those right now. Those TLDs are important. Uh, and also Carolyn Larson, uh, Andrew Hoppen, and John Wunderlich, who joined us uh, via Skype. We thank you all for watching, and uh, I think this is a call to action for everybody to get out there. Uh, government, Think of government as a platform. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going to build on that platform? That's absolutely right.